so about spark function uh, features and all so guys uh, some of those things these are kind of you can treat them as the different features of spark that it provides powerful caching and disk persistence capabilities i think i talked about it right i think i talked about it that that the results or probably even the raw data if you want to cache cache means you just want to keep it in the memory you can keep it in the memory as well as you you so it is not just that you are going to keep all of the data in the memory you want you might want some of the data in the you know disk also there is there is something called the you know graceful degradation uh, here we'll talk about that when we'll be talking about the rdds and the caching things and all that stuff but yes you can either keep all of your data into the memory you can or, or you can also on the contrary side you can even choose to keep all of your data into the disk also in that case probably spark would be no better than hadoop okay but yes uh, it it gives you various options it is quite possible and there these options are there embedded within the api itself so you you can tell what exactly is the caching mechanism which you are looking at okay then of course it results into the faster batch because of the i mean obvious thing right your processings are happening in the memory they are faster so still see this your processing is still batch but it is much faster batch right those people uh, like uh, venkat niranjan others right rajesh probably you must have seen uh, storm it was we never used the word batch right we never use the word batch that was a true real time processing system right that's that's another difference anyway it's like i'm covering it from multiple angles uh, okay so another another thing it's real time stream processing but the processing which happens for the stream okay now when i talk about spark streaming actually i'm talking about the streams which it gets that is a something which is a real time processing in fact when i'll be covering the spark uh, spark streaming for you people i will be showing you the use cases and at that time when i will be running it you will actually be seeing that uh, i can kind of you know uh, probe a specific directory or something i can say hey this is my directory whatever comes new okay so uh, probably i'll just run a simple word count at that point of time and what would happen is as and when the new data would come it will immediately be computed you will get immediate statistics so probably uh, i think there were some specific queries i don't know if uh, those people are here in this class or not somebody was asking about the sliding word count right amita was it you or probably i don't know somebody else right so but i hope even if you're not probably all of you can easily assume that what exactly am uh, am i coming to right it is actually the sliding word count itself right so as and when there is new data which comes immediately it is calculated right and if you just do a, this word count on the continuously pouring in new data this is called a sliding word count or sliding whatever algorithm you want to apply right guys so spark streaming is something which is which will find its use case there i think i'm going to cover that then i'll come to the spark streaming part okay then typically it leads towards the faster decision making and all that stuff then other thing is since your data is there in memory you can definitely go for iterative algorithms right that's the base limitation with hadoop you hadoop being a distributed processing system and that on the disk side and no sharing of the data definitely it leads towards the non iterative algorithms that's the base limitation right so uh, how do you support by the way that's again uh, so i can see that there are so many guys who have done hadoop course right how do you support iterations iterative or recursive algorithms how do you support recursive algorithms in hadoop and i would appreciate only one line answer or probably just two two words okay animesh santosh what about others guys quickly yes it's a question okay so question question is how do you support uh, recursions in hadoop has somebody applied graph search in hadoop right it is not easy that's that's good 
I understand that. But definitely there are use cases, right? Graph search, has anybody applied that in Hadoop? By the way, I, not, not to give you much about my credentials and all, I have applied it. And we ha that graph search typically goes towards the iterative algorithms, right? You have to find out the parent, child, child, and then you know further children, further children. You want to create a tree, and then multiple trees, and let's say Dijkstra's algorithm and all. If you have to implement, then you typically would be using, uh, and assuming that your graph is so big, several you know millions of nodes in the graph, then how do you apply it? The answer is iterative methods. Has anybody heard of it? But if you've not heard of it, probably you can just search for it. Just just as a case of, I'm not going to discuss it within the class, but it's kind of uh, you know, uh, try something on your own. Especially those people who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, who are from Hadoop background. I think your meaning of iterative is different from mine. No, we both mean the same thing: recursion and iteration. They are two different things. But recursions are supported as iterative MapReduce in Hadoop. That is my that is my statement. Okay, Santosh. So anyway, uh, if if somebody wants to get more details about it, probably you can get connected to me. Uh, whenever I mean, I would be more than happy to share my experiences with you after the class, of course. Okay. Interactive data analysis, okay, that's the great thing about it. That, that is another very good feature about Spark. So guys, uh, Hadoop, right? You have written a MapReduce, right? Now you submit it. And then you have to wait till the time either it fails or it gives a result. Whatever happens in between, either it is visible in the form of those counters or something, but nothing else, right? Also. You cannot really, I mean, it is possible, in theory it is definitely possible that, or even in practical also, that you can see stage by stage how exactly your data is transforming, right? So you want to see, let's say after mapper what happened, after reducer what happened, then I took it, this, took this output to some somewhere else, and then how exactly the data is transforming, right? This is something which you can do, but it is much more painful. It is not quite interactive. Every time you want to do something, you have to do some code change and then apply it, create the jar, submit it, and then do. It's not interactive. Whereas, when it comes to Spark, the best thing is Spark Shell. It gives you an interactive way of doing your data analysis. Once you verify your theory, yes, okay, these are the things which I want to do, these are the things, these are the ways it is, you know, it is giving me the result, and of course it is going to be fast, no need to tell about it, right? Once you are quite sure about it, then you can probably go ahead and create your separate Scala app or whatever, Java app or something, and then you can go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, supply your jobs, right? Which is, which makes your data analysis quite interactive and fast and effective, no need to tell about it, right? So those are some of the things which are really good advantages about it. 